the FDIC would have three to five years to liquidate the bank and so three to five years, right? Bank gets bailed in three to five years to ensure that the shareholders and the uninsured creditors, that's the depositors, bear the losses of the failed bank. So three to five years to ensure that the shareholders and the uninsured creditors or depositors bear the losses of the failed bank, that's you. In a recent video, precious metals expert Andy Schechtman delves into the importance of gold in today's uncertain financial landscape. Backed by non-biased research from Morningstar, Schechtman emphasizes the role of gold as a stabilizing force and an insurance policy in investment portfolios. He draws attention to the shifting global perspective on gold, citing examples like Saudi Arabia's substantial investment in a sovereign wealth fund dedicated to mining precious metals alongside China. Schechtman also refers to Zoltan Pausar's insights, highlighting a global move towards transparency in commodities. Schechtman refers to the Ibotson study, which demonstrated the benefits of including gold in investment portfolios during a period of interest rate suppression. Despite potential shifts in interest rates, Gold remains an inversely correlated asset to the US stock market and the Western financial system. The study showcased greater stability and returns in portfolios that included gold compared to those without. Schechtman argues that gold, often considered a reserve and insurance policy, could replace traditional perceptions of us treasuries, especially as confidence in global financial systems wavers. Before we continue to delve into this discussion, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. Yeah, I mean, they are a non-biased research company that was bought by Morningstar. They don't have a dog in the fight, and they show s several portfolios, each of them having allocations to gold in various quantities and versus those that have none. And, and in every example, it, it gave it greater stability and a greater return. And, you know, and that's the point is that, you know, it's more of a it's more of a reserve. It's more of a uh, insurance policy. Well, that's what I think a lot of people would consider U.S. Treasuries to be, and that's why I think that there is a good portion of the world that would say, you know what, I don't care, I I'm gonna look at gold as our treasuries and we're gonna put our excess into gold, which I believe will be part of the new system. I mean, look at Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has over $1 trillion, I think the number is 1.3 trillion in a new, um, it's a new fund. I don't know how to how to call it properly, but it's a new um, if it's a fund or a, a sovereign wealth fund or whatever it is. It's a Saudi government program to invest globally in mining. They're going around the world and buying up all they can or investing all they can alongside of China in mining uh, precious metals. And I think there's a lot to be said for precious metals and industrial metals. This is what Zoltan Pozar said. We are moving into a a period of time of 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 transparency in commodities and so you know the ibbotson study basically said look and and you know the ibbotson study was done more so during a period of time of interest rate suppression but if we're going back in that direction again where we're going to lower interest rates and think that the market is not as powerful as the fed i think that will be something the fed will ultimately learn that the market is more powerful than they are when ultimately the world says you know i mean look Dunning, and I can't understand why anyone would be foolish enough to lend the U.S. government money with any length of duration. I understand why people would buy six-month treasuries or less, paying 5%, certainly better than being in a bank account, certainly better than having any exposure to the bank if you go to treasurydirect.gov, because if the U.S. government defaults on its loans, we have bigger problems. You'll see banks you know, cascading. But when you talk about lending money to the government in a 10 year or a 30 year, I think you're out of your mind. Who the hell would do that? And I think that's kind of why we're beginning to see alternatives, perhaps, or the way that the world looks at gold differently and why you're seeing them accumulate it. And when Ibbotson wrote that report, we had interest rates that were, you know, at or near zero or really, really low. And their, their comment was that it is the only inversely correlated asset to the U.S. stock market. And in many respects, it still is. It's the inversely correlated asset to the Western system. And so I think that it will become more and more and more important to view it that way. Um, and, you know, the, the big, big, big money is always front running. And when you see the most well-informed traders in the world, not only the wealthiest, but the most informed 
for two years running by more gold than at any time in central bank history. If you're not catching this, you're missing something. At the same time, we see great volatility and long tails in the bond market auctions where there is not enough demand for the two and the 10 and the 30 year treasuries that they're selling unless they continue to jack up the rates. So there, there will be demand for these treasuries until there isn't, but at some level, question is what level will that be? And so this is what I mean about the market being more powerful than the Fed. And you know, if not, if, if there is no demand because the rates are not high enough to compensate not only for inflation, not only for default risk, but also for just for the outright risk of higher rates. The institutional investors are going to demand this. They're going to demand higher return for those three pieces of risk. And if they don't do it, well, who is? The Fed. It's called monetization of assets, monetization of debt. It's called Weimar Republic. All roads lead to the same place. And that's why they're, they're kind of damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. It is an election year. And, you know, the Fed is highly political. It's interesting, even, even the people who speak for Jerome Powell uh, he said, you know, he was shocked by how just in a period of two weeks he, he, he changed his tune. Did someone tap him on the shoulder and said, Jerome, um, Jerome, there's an election coming up. What are you doing? And so, okay, we'll pivot and we will give in. But all that they are doing, each one of these QEs or these pivotings gets us that much closer to the all at once moment. And to show you how stupid things are right now, we may have talked about this last week or not. I don't know how desperate they are to keep things hidden from us in terms how in terms of how they get money into the system. This new bank funding program that's supposed to sunset in March is allowing banks to borrow money from the Fed at 4.8% and turn around and park it right back with them at 5.3. Well, all of that money liquefying the, the bank's balance sheets, it's just a joke. It's a complete and total joke that they're allowing this to happen. Or how about the revision? You know, the, what comes out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics? You know, we, we're, the Fed does things based upon, uh, based upon employment and based upon um, uh, inflation. Well, we know that they lie to us about inflation. And John Williams of Shadow Stats has done a magnificent job of showing us that. Right now, under the 1980 metrics, inflation's at 10% or greater. Under the revision to 1990, about 8% or greater. Not the three or four they're telling us. But the BLS, you should, we should usurp the L and just call it BS because they constantly lie. Quietly, they just revised the payroll data from 2023. Most people missed that. But the total revision of 2023 was 443,000 jobs or 40% of all the payroll growth. Oops. Highlighting global trends, Sheckman points out the unprecedented gold purchases made by well-informed and wealthy traders, signaling a significant shift in sentiment. Concurrently, he notes volatility in the bond market auctions with insufficient demand for treasuries unless interest rates are raised. This raises questions about the market's power relative to the Federal Reserve's influence and the potential consequences of insufficient demand for government debt. Sheckman discusses the desperation evident in the financial system, such as banks borrowing from the Fed at lower rates and profiting by parking the funds back with them at higher rates. He critiques the Bureau of Labor Statistics for its inconsistent reporting and revising payroll data, emphasizing the lack of transparency and honesty in the system. This leads him to express skepticism about the country's ability to inspire confidence globally and suggests that other nations may be re-evaluating their reliance on the S in the wake of geopolitical and economic uncertainties. The birth-death model was wrong. We're revising it downward by 443,000 after we already based all of our decision-making supposedly upon these numbers. We're being lied to. They've been, they were wrong in 2008 when they said that some pride crisis was contained and a few days later it blew up. They were wrong when they said there was no inflation and then it was transitory and then it was structural and then it was on its way down and now we've engineered a soft landing. They lie continuously. And I think that people need to understand that this is not a country that inspires confidence. And I think the big money around the world understands that and this is why you are seeing them sell bonds and buy gold because it is wealth. And when people say, who's gonna trust China and Russia? Who the hell trusts us anymore? Or the Bureau of Labor Statistics, or the current administration, 
or any of this stuff that is is less than forthright. Um, and I think now it's creeping into people's psyche regarding the, the 2024 election. Is it going to be fair? Is the Justice Department fair? All of these things are happening coincidental. All con uh, They're all coming together at the same time. And I think it's important to realize when we talk about the bond market and the rest of the world's appetite for holding our debt, a country that's losing confidence globally, um, that, you know, maybe just maybe this um, recency bias of the last 50 years needs to be reevaluated. I think you're seeing a lot of the countries do just that. So I, I just, I, I wrote this down also because I think people need to understand it. It's one thing for me to always say that you're an unsecured general creditor of the bank under the Dodd-Frank Act and you can get bailed in. Let me read it to you. Bail-ins. Under Dodd-Frank, as, as receiver, the FDIC would have three to five years to liquidate the bank and so three to five years, right? Bank gets bailed in three to five years to ensure that the shareholders and the uninsured creditors, that's the depositors, bear the losses of the failed bank. So three to five years to ensure that the shareholders and the uninsured creditors or depositors bear the losses of the failed bank, that's you, remove bank management responsible for the failure. Well, maybe it's the FDI or the, the Federal Reserve uh, that should bear some of that responsibility, but I digress, and make payouts to the claimants that are at least equal to the amount they would have received under bankruptcy covering FDIC insurance liability to qualified depositors for up to $250,000. So that comes right from the Dodd-Frank Act. The conversation shifts to the Dodd-Frank Act, with Schechtman highlighting the potential for unsecured general creditors to be bailed in during a bank failure. He emphasizes the lengthy three to five year period during which shareholders and uninsured creditors would bear losses. This discussion underscores the fragility of the current financial system and prompts a reevaluation of conventional wisdom about ownership and security in assets. Sheckman points out upcoming challenges in the US financial system, with $117 billion in office building loans due for refinancing in 2024. He expresses concerns about higher interest rates impacting the ability of businesses, especially small ones, to meet their financial obligations. With 70% of small business loans and commercial real estate handled by regional banks, Schechtman sees a potential time bomb in the making that could trigger a chain reaction of financial instability. They have three to five years to pay you 250,000 when you had 2 million in the bank. So you might get 250,000 within three to five years, God willing. The point is, is that these are not things that are made up. This is real. And when you read the David Rogers web book or go to YouTube and Google it, he actually narrates this hour long YouTube. It's, it's terrifying and people don't believe it, but it's true. And it has a lot to do with, with the way that changes have been made under custodial ownership and beneficial ownership. You need to listen to it and read it. I think you'll see that it, it's setting up so that many of the things that people feel they own outright, actually they they do not own. And this is why we talk about gold being assets that are not simultaneously someone else's liability. It's very, very true. When you talk about the banks, the U.S. Uh, office buildings have $117 billion that come due here in 2024 to be refinanced or reset. Um, and, you know, Where's that going to, how's that going to happen at rates that have gone much higher? And as the economy is slowing down, businesses can't afford it. You're going to see bankruptcies, uh, a small business bankruptcies in particular, as the small business is being squeezed and commercial real estate problems, all of it, 70% of both the small business loans and leases and the commercial real estate loans and leases are, are, are handled by the small and regional banks. It's a time bomb waiting to happen. And the first one, I think, the first one, that gets bailed in will set a fuse that will freak people out to no to no level. I think people will go running and, and it will set off a chain reaction. So, you know, could there be a recession? On top of all of this, you know, the, the current deficits that are run are, are deficits that are running two trillion a year. We have ten trillion dollars in bond payments due this year. How the hell are they gonna pay for that? Oh, I know we'll borrow more money. And so we're borrowing money to pay our current obligations where we spent $900 billion on interest payments last year, 900 billion. And we've talked about by 2031, 100% of all the tax revenues will be go, go to use, just pay the interest on the debt 
and mandatory entitlements like Social Security. And that means everything, everything else um, that will be discretionary, including military spending, will need to be borrowed. Mm -hmm.